Welcome to the Australian Hiker Podcast, Australia's longest running hiking podcast, downloaded over half a million times in over 145 countries and providing you with an Australian perspective on all things hiking. We're your hosts, Tim and Jill Savage. This is episode 194 of the Australian Hiker Podcast. And in this week's episode, we do a final wrap up of my recent Tasmanian trail trip. Before we get into today's episode, if you'd like to help support Australian Hiker and this podcast, there are a couple of ways that you can help us out. Firstly, by subscribing on your podcast host of choice so that each episode is available as soon as it's published. And if you have the opportunity, leave us a five star review. Another way to support us is go to the Australian Hiker website at www.australianhiker.com.au and click on the supporters page and buy us a coffee. You can do a one-off donation or become a monthly supporter. All donations are greatly appreciated and help us to continue producing this podcast and blog. Now let's get on to today's episode. Now in today's episode, we're going to go into a few things uh, concerning my recent Tasmanian trail trip. So we're going to look at the uh, where we ended up with the trip, the reality versus expectations, things to consider if you're going to be going through and doing this hike or considering to do this hike, and why you should or shouldn't do this trail. To get the best out of this podcast, I recommend you follow along with my written overview of this uh, podcast in the trail section of Australian Hiker, and that'll give you some images and some uh, a, a comparison point when I'm talking about things on the podcast. We hope you enjoy. So where did I end up with, with this Tasmanian trail trip? Now, for a number of people that were following me on the online Garmin map, they would have noticed that my map point didn't move from New Norfolk, and that was for a couple of reasons. I decided New Norfolk was always a rest day or a rest point, and I actually arrived in New Norfolk on late Saturday afternoon, and the intention was twofold. One was to do the podcast interview or podcast episode, and the other one was to pick up my next mailbox. Now, Australia Post doesn't open on the weekends, or it opens Saturday morning, but it wasn't opening during the rest of the time, so I needed to wait till Monday to actually pick up my next resupply box to finish off the last section of the trail. One thing that I had been paying close attention to over the period that I was in Tasmania was the situation with COVID in New South Wales, and I hadn't didn't have a lot of time to spend trawling the internet, but I was certainly aware of what was going on and talking to Jill on a regular basis to find out what was happening. And when I got into New Norfolk, into the hotel, it was an opportunity to dry some of my gear off, do a bit of cleaning, uh, have a bit of a rest, and apart from doing the podcast, also to see what was going on in the mainland. And at that stage, it was becoming very apparent that the situation in New South Wales was progressively getting worse and worse, not better, like everyone had hoped it would do. And given that Canberra is sitting in the middle of New South Wales, there was a concern that at some point uh, we would go into a lockdown. And traditionally, when we do go into a lockdown in Canberra, it's hard and fast. Yeah, and it's an interesting one because we are in the middle of New South Wales, um, but we also have a lot of um, our workforce that lives just over the border in New South Wales. So it's it's quite a porous border. Um, and uh, as you were saying, Tim, the the situation was evolving. I think that's probably the the best we can say. <laughs> Now, that was one concern. I mean, being in Tasmania wouldn't really have really worried me too much about you know, if ACT had have gone into lockdown. But my concern was that there, there had been a case come, in, come into Tasmania on one of the flights. And given what was going on in the mainland, all I could see was that potentially Tasmania was also going to go into lockdown and that I would have been in lockdown, in a hotel somewhere, in a, in a state that wasn't my home state for a couple of weeks. Uh, well, at least, potentially. Um, and certainly the way the, the Delta variant was spreading, that was entirely possible. If Tasmania didn't go into lockdown, which is currently the situation, my other main concern was that the flights were going to be cancelled. And again, I would, I would have no way of getting back home. 
So over a period of a couple of days, uh, in fact, Saturday afternoon, Sunday and early Monday, I had discussions with Jill and I had a thought about what was going on. And Monday morning, it was decision time. Uh, and I decided, well, I can either continue on five or six days to finish off the end of the trip, or I could head back home. I think I said, I think it's time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so I ended up getting uh, a booking a flight on Monday, flying back to Canberra on Tuesday, uh, and then Canberra went into lockdown on Thursday afternoon. So I think, yeah, while I could have potentially still continued the trip. And it was it all it was all a bit a bit hypothetical, I suppose. I mean, you know, everything may well have been perfectly fine, but it was just a bit too hard to 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 make that guarantee. And and I did have a hard point where I had to return to work. Um, it wasn't an option that I could add another week or two just because I was in Tasmania and couldn't get back home. I really had to be at, at work by a certain time. Well, the other factor was that um, with the distance that you had left, you were still going to have to spend a fair amount of time off trail, um, walking along the roads and and not actually following the trail because of the um, the rain that had been through and the swollen rivers. Yeah, and that that was a consideration. I think um, one of my uh, reasons for doing this trip was that I wanted to do a, a, a safe state, for want of a better term. Tasmania <laughs> was certainly that. Uh, I was originally planning on doing the Heisen Trail, uh, and the Heisen Trail, up until the day I was due to start, I couldn't actually get into that South Australia. And then, then on that day, they opened it back up, and the the ability was to actually do the trip. But by that stage, there wasn't enough notice. I'd already had to make up my mind what I was doing, and I'd committed to Tasmania. Now, this sort of leads us into the reality versus expectations. Doing the Tasmanian Trail in wintertime is not the best option. My main concern before I started was snow, and I'd been watching some of their webcams, particularly based around the lakes on the central plateau, which is the high point of the trail, and I was finding that uh, that you know, it was snow and then the snow would disappear. A few days later, a bit more snow, then it would disappear. And I think the Monday before I actually flew down to Tasmania, there was I woke up on the Monday morning and there was a good 70 centimetres of snow on the ground. And then by the end of the day, it had all washed away with the rain. So snow certainly was an issue with a lot of the times of the year, but certainly during the the, the, the winter months and in talking to Tasmanian people, they tell me that August and September is really their, their main snow period. <laughs> Which is great, wasn't it? <laughs> so that was my expectation. The reality was the snow didn't impact on me, me at all. I potentially may have come across the snow on the last day of finishing this trip, uh, but it wouldn't have had a bit of an impact. And my choice in wearing a lightweight boot and a carrying snowshoes just in case wasn't actually necessary, but again, it's hindsight. You don't uh, know you that. Just don't know. And yeah, you know, and if it had been anything up to a, a, a meter in snow, uh, certainly having a waterproof boot and having snowshoes would have been critical. The thing that didn't, I didn't probably put enough emphasis on was the amount of water that was around. So Tasmania typically has roughly, or at least Devonport has a, a rainfall of roughly about 1,200 millimetres rain a year, which is roughly twice what we get here in Canberra. And the rainy period of the year really tends to be the wintertime, with August and September being the wettest months of the year. And, and this was a particularly wet period as well, yeah, on top so, of that. So ignoring the fact that this was a rainy period of the year, it was a very wet year compared to previous years. And what I found that uh, – I don't mind the rain, but what I found that uh, I decided to do where possible the detours to avoid the rivers, and the Tasmanian Trail does actually have a number of set detours just for that reason. And I did one of these, the first detour, uh, got around the area I needed to get around and then came across Lobster Rivulet. Uh, and again, I'm guessing that a riv rivulet is a small river, which is pretty much what it looks like. I got to this rivulet and thought, ah, oh, this is interesting. I spent probably about half hour, 40 minutes checking the water, going upstream and downstream, seeing what the options were. Uh, and I got a, um, a test of the water just offshore and it was about a, uh, 70 centimetres deep. 
and I couldn't really tell how deep it was in the middle, but certainly there was a bit of white water in that area, and it did look like it was deeper on the other side. I then grabbed a sapling off the ground, uh, and it, this weighed around about 25 kilos. Is uh, that a sapling? That's, that's <laughs> it was a sapling. It was probably around about um, 100 mils across and probably about five metres long. Um, you didn't pull it up. It no, was just no, a... it, was, it was on the ground. Okay. So I, I threw it into the river, and it hit the river, and it went. Uh, and I thought, this is not a good option. So I decided, you know, this was later in the afternoon. There was nothing much I could really do. Uh, so I set up my tent. I checked the water a couple of hours later. I set up a marker, checked the water a couple of hours later, and nothing had really changed. So I slept there for the night. Got up the next morning and discovered that the water had risen another 30 centimetres and a lot of the white water had disappeared because all the rocks were now underwater. So as a individual, there was no way that I was going to try and do this. I might have been okay, but, you know, if something had have happened, if I have lost footing, got washed downstream, you know, this is winter time, it's cold, it wouldn't have been a safe option. Uh, and then waiting the next morning, if I had have crossed, I would have ended up having to get into the tent and get dry before I could have done anything. And this is assuming, you know, with, with the water 70 centimetres to a metre deep, it's likely that the bottom half of my pack would have got saturated anyway, including potentially my sleeping bag and all my gear. Yeah, but as you say, that's, you know, 70 centimetres to a metre at the edges, or at least the edge that you were on, um, and who knows what it was like in the middle, and, and it did very much from the image and the video that you sent through. It did look very much deeper on the other side. And from my perspective, I, I must admit, I looked at it and I'm thinking the video and the, and the photo, which are in the written write-up, just, don't, just didn't do it justice. You know, you, you film it and <laughs> you think this is not what it looks like. Uh, because Well, if there's any consolation, there's a fellow I know who, who you know, is pretty experienced army and has done a lot of these river crossings and he took one look and he said, oh, you wouldn't want to do that. <laughs> Now, and particularly as a solo hiker, and this is the issue with being a solo hiker, you've got to assess risk a bit differently than if you're traveling in a group. So potentially if there had been three or four of us, it may have been worthwhile chanting. And again, I say may, because you would have had people there to keep control of things and help and support people you know, going across in twos rather than going across as a solo. So that left me with turning around and backtracking half a day to where I turned off on the road to where uh, it took me down to this rivulet. And then I ended up going into uh, Deloraine, which was a trail that was about seven kilometres off town, and spending a couple of days in Deloraine. Now, Deloraine was my first podcast night. So I got into Deloraine on the, um, the Tuesday, got myself sorted out, dried stuff, uh, and did the podcast on the Wednesday before, again, deciding what my options were and what I was going to go through and do. And based on that river system and based on what I've seen of the other rivers, realistically, none of the other rivers I saw on this trip were crossable. They were probably worse than this one that, that stopped me <laughs> in my tracks. So you know, it, it forced me to have a situation to uh, – I'd already lost a day because of backtracking – I was travelling slower than I'd actually planned, and I'll explain why that wasn't a moment. And I found that uh, uh, I decided to skip ahead of the central plateau uh, and restart the, the walk again at Ouse. Now, as a, uh, a location, I was due to pick up a, a, a drop box, uh, and it, it, there was it, it seemed to go wandering. Jill had posted it. Uh, <laughs> it. It was telling me it was going to take another five or six days to get there. So I needed to uh, pick up the previous drop box, which I didn't have enough food to get to. So I had someone very kindly enough offer to, to give me a lift. And we picked up that first drop box, and I headed towards Ooze to start the walk again. And just about 10 minutes before we pulled into Ooze, I got a text message from Australia Post saying my box had turned up. So I actually went in, picked that one up, and forwarded it on to uh, uh, New Norfolk to carry me through for the last part of the trip. So that was really where I ended up with this on that, that, that trip. So from a, a water perspective, 
that I think is probably the limiting factor. Beaten by the water. Beaten by the water, yeah. So I ended up doing a lot more road working. So as I walked out of Ouse, the river that I was due to cross again was flooded. So there was no way that I was going to be trying to cross that. So I road walked uh, and then connected back on the trail later on. So I ended up crossing the Derwent River on a, uh, a single lane bridge. Uh, and camped in a campsite that was off trail, and it was quite a good campsite actually. So again, I've got some photos on the uh, the website on that one on the write up before heading sort of connecting back up with the trail again. But I found that 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 w- the issue with the water forced me into a lot more road walking yeah. than I would have liked. Uh, now there is road walking on this trail, and and not big sections, but there is sections of it, and the roads in Tasmania aren't the best for doing road walking, uh, some of the verges were really narrow and you'd have flat road and then maybe 50 centimetres and then a guardrail or flat road and a steep drop-off that was really wasn't walkable. So I found myself almost bouncing from one side of the road to the other depending on where the best side of the road to walk on was. And in some instances, I was walking along the bitumen along the edge of the road, just keeping a, a close ear out for cars and stepping off uh, and waiting till I went past. And thankfully, there wasn't a lot of cars there at all. So this has been a really interesting trip, a different experience, um, and you know we'll talk a little bit more about that. But what what was it that you really liked about this trail? I think there were a couple of things. One that was in Tasmania, and it was located within a single state. So from a <laughs> I suppose in a normal world, from a COVID perspective, you know, if you lived lived in Tasmania, yeah, you wouldn't have to leave the state. So it's 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 the only really long distance trail in the state. It is multi purpose, which I'll talk about in a moment, and it provided the ability to actually see Tasmania. The only other time that I've been to Tasmania was to uh, do the overland track, and we flew into Launceston, uh, got a bus from Lawn- bus from Launceston down to the trailhead, did the walk and then got a bus from Lake Sinclair back to Hobart. So, yeah, that was my only experience with Tasmania before, and I thought this was a good opportunity to see parts of the state that I hadn't come across before. Now, this is a multi-purpose trail. It's designed for bike riders, horses, and walkers, and as a result, it bypasses the national parks because you're not allowed to have horses in national parks, uh, or at least the majority of them anyway. So it means that you're travelling on management road or travelling in a lot of areas that a lot of hikers probably never would see. You're travelling through rural Tasmania. Uh, and again, I saw towns that just weren't on the tourist route. Uh, and there were some some great little towns uh, and meeting people from rural Tasmania that you never would come across. Yeah, great people. And you were saying that, you know, you'd be walking along and, and lots of people would slow down and ask if you were okay and as they were driving past and, and then head off. So they weren't just buzzing past, they were noticing and they were engaging and uh, and uh, you kept sending me pictures of your food in those little towns. Some of them were, you know, huge uh, counter meals at pubs and the bakery items and all of those sorts of things. So I think there's a lot... There's a lot that we would not not normally experience um, that you've been able to experience. Yeah, and, and I think you know from that respect alone, I think this trail is often often downplayed as being not a hike, and it isn't. It, it is not a bushwalk. You know, it's a hike, but it's certainly not a bushwalk. And I think if you go into this trip with that in mind that this is going to be a rural tour of Tasmania, there will be road walking and you are going to be walking on management road, then you won't have any unrealistic expectations of where are the panoramic views into the sub-temperate rainforest and all that sort of thing. So I think um, in that respect, it, it was a an interesting trip. Uh, it was a trip that I probably expected it to be as it was, apart from the water, and, um, you know, it, it's certainly one of those sort of trips that, you know, while people might choose to do things like the Lara Pinta Trail, you know, if you're looking for a long-distance trail, it's not a bad option. So what didn't you like? The things that I didn't like probably were in relation to some of the, the narrow roads. As I said, some of the narrow roads on in Tasmania aren't meant for pedestrians. You know, there's just not – I'm used to – New South Wales, in a lot of cases where there's 
quite wide road verges. Western Australia is the same. You know, Northern Territory, there are fairly wide verges off the road that you can get away from the traffic. So Yeah, but the main thing about that was that you weren't supposed to be on those roads, though, were you? Well, no, I I wasn't supposed to be on them as much. There was some section of road walking, but not as much. So in that respect, that was just a a function of the environment. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, and it was either, well, I can't do the trip or cancel it, or I just keep on going and doing it in a different way. So I think in that respect, it was actually quite good. You were going to talk about your boots. Yeah, so I talked about that I wasn't moving as fast as I I would have liked. So when I did the Bibbleman track in 2018, I was averaging around about 31, 32 kilometres per day. And that's what I – I hadn't actually expected to do those sort of distances. I think I'd probably expected to do around about 26 kilometres a day, I think I worked out. But in all honesty, 20 kilometres is probably about as good as I got on this trip. I had one day where I did 22 kilometres and partly that was the necessity to change my gear. So going from a heavy-duty trail runner, uh, going from a pair of pants that's reasonably breathable to wearing a, I would say, a mid-weight boot uh, and wearing alpine pants just in case I had the need to travel through snow, that certainly did slow me down. So the boots weighed more than twice what my trail runners did. And typically, the comparison is for each kilo on your feet, it's the equivalent of carrying six kilos in your pack. So I certainly was carrying an additional kilo, more than an additional kilo uh, on my feet compared to what I was used to. And that was translating into a heavier load, which was partly slowing me down. And you were also carrying your snowshoes as well. Carrying snowshoes. Just so in case. I was, my pack weight uh, fully loaded with water, snowshoes, and my main food was around about 21, 22 kilos, whereas normally I would have been maybe up to around about 17 and a half, 18 kilos. So those couple of things slowed me down. And if I'm honest, I'm a bit older than I was a few years ago, so I certainly wasn't travelling as fast as I could have been. And the time of the year, you know, it's easy when the sun comes up at sort of six and and sort of sets at six but in this situation here it was relatively dark until probably quarter to seven and it was getting dark certainly by six at the latest so I was trying to find a a campsite probably around about four o'clock so I could have have dinner get settled in before it did get dark. The other couple of things that I did enjoy about this well the other things I didn't enjoy about this hike was um, the roadkill. Now Coming from New South Wales, the average roadkill is the occasional kangaroo and lots of wombats, at least in my part of the world. (laughs) In Tasmania, the roadkill was wallabies and lots of them. I think I saw one echidna and I think I did see one wombat, but otherwise it was all wallabies. And I stopped counting, but I got over 100 100 dead wallabies and it was almost every 40 or 50 metres there'd be a dead wallaby in in the gutter Uh, off the road. Now, while I'm talking about the gutter off the road, that was probably one of the best sources of water uh, on the trail. And I must admit, the first time I thought, oh, yeah, this is a good spot to top up on water, I thought, no, I'll leave it for a little while longer. Walked up the road 15 metres and there was a dead dead wallaby in in the, the flow of the water just a bit further on. So while I do carry a filter... I'm never quite game when there's a dead animal in there to, 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 to use a filter because there's probably viruses and things that just aren't being filtered out. So that was a bit unfortunate um, that, you know, that that was what was the situation was. But I came away with the view that if you are going to use the drainage channels to top up your water, you do it towards the top of the hill where the flow starts uh, and, you know, and the dead wallabies are typically further down. <laughs> I think the other thing that I would comment on this walk as well is that it's not really a plants and animal type walk. You know, if it had been through the national parks, lots of spectacular stuff to see. But in this situation, I saw very few flowering plants. I did see a a couple of wallabies live. I saw a a potteroo on one occasion hopping around. Uh, But in most cases, and and I did see... uh, uh, some rosellas or some some parrots, which I hadn't seen before, uh, but otherwise it was pretty limited on the, on the plants and animals spectacular sort of thing. 
Well, you were doing a lot of diversions though too. That was the other thing. So, you know, and it was winter. So maybe a different time of year would be slightly different experience. Well, I think it would be. I mean, certainly, you know, they, they, the guidebook does talk about the guidebook does talk about snakes, and you know, didn't see a snake. The <laughs> I wasn't thinking trip. snakes. Yeah. I was thinking more flowering plants. But. Yeah, and, and certainly during the warmer months of the year, you would expect to see more. But again, because you are travelling on roadways, you're travelling through rural land, and in some instances, you're travelling across people's properties, and you are travelling on management roads. You are going to be limited with this, so you're not going to see. The wildlife and the and the flowering plants that you'd see on one of the other well-known hiking trails. The other issue we had with diver or I had with diversions was also to do with um, timing more than anything else. So there was one property where you needed to let the farmer know that you were coming through, and it wasn't just because he didn't like hikers, but he also let hunters use the property as well, uh, and he didn't want people walking through or cycling or riding a horse through when people were there shooting. So it was more from a safety perspective. Uh, and really, I hit that area fairly quickly. Uh, I really didn't have enough opportunity to give him enough, give him notice. And again, there was a section coming off that, which was also on private land, that would have required a water crossing uh, that just wasn't viable. So I tended to skip around that. There are certainly sections of private land, but it's, it's really a matter of whether the water within the creeks and the rivers will let you access them more so than anything else. Yeah, yeah, it's an interesting one, isn't it? I think one of the things that is um, probably the the main theme of this is be adaptable and be flexible and, and uh, you know, you have a plan but be prepared to modify your plan depending on what's happening at the time. And I think certainly with this trip, that's that's the – it sort of just came across at some point that's what I've decided to do. I thought, well, okay, uh, hitting a rock, lobster rivulet and just and not being able to cross it, it's like, well, do I then pull the pin on the whole hike or then I, do I just skip ahead to some point and continue walking? Uh, and it was uh, it was more that, I, as I said, I decided to skip the central plateau simply because I wasn't travelling as fast as I, I needed to be uh, and that would have left me a bit short on food for the next uh, – next uh, uh, a section. So I decided that skipping ahead of that and getting into the central uh, area of Tasmania was a better choice, a better option. Now, in, in relation to things to consider, if people want to go through and look at doing this as a walk, as I said, I'd just like to reconfirm here, this is not a bushwalk. And as long as you realise that, you won't have any false expectations. But it is worth doing. Yeah, I think it is worth doing. Uh, but I, I would also say choose your time of year. <laughs> um, so while it is doable 12 months of the year, I would probably say look at doing the walk probably from around about mid-October through to about mid-April. Uh, and if you look at the rainfall for that area, pick the months where the water is low, uh, the river crossing is going to be easy, you're going to be able to get across without too much problem. But then you also need to be thinking about Hot weather and bushfires as well. Yeah, so I mean, you know, they're saying that you know, supposedly uh, the, the the hottest temperatures tend to be around about twenty three degrees. Although I did have someone on social media said they started doing this trick and the trip and they got off trail because the temperatures got to forty two. Now, not normal, but you know, that's a potential if you try and do that sort of yeah. stuff in December, yeah. January. Yeah. So it's it's really a matter of picking the right time of the year. And I think, you know, I suppose if, if you had a choice, I'd probably say March, April is probably not a bad time because any snow that was up in the high areas would have melted and run off. The water levels in the rivers and streams would be at a reasonable sort of period. But it, but it is a matter of playing it by year. And as Jill said, you know, fires, there were fires there over the last couple of years uh, on the trail. So you needed to consider that. But that's a consideration for any hike you do any, anywhere in Australia. So it's just a matter of paying attention to what's ahead of you and seeing whether that's an issue or not. I'd also say that you know, one of the questions I got asked was why I was actually sending food boxes ahead when I was walking through a lot of towns. And you know, this, this trail wasn't done as a formal extension of the Bicentennial National Trail, but it does use the same logo and was designed to almost be an extension that you could keep on going, uh, get to, get onto the ferry, get to Devonport Ferry Terminal and start walking from there. 
I think in that respect, yes, the towns were certainly there. And my response to why I use uh, resupply boxes is twofold. I'm really picky on my food. I I don't. I'm not going to be able to go into a supermarket, buy tins of tuna or packets of tuna, and decide. Yep, I'll make do with those. I hate tin tuna. Um, <laughs> See, and, I don't and, mind and, that and, and packet tuna. <laughs> so yeah, and, and I'm not going to use two minute noodles. So it's going to be. I, I have pretty specific tastes, and on that sort of um, bent as well, I'd had my food. Uh, analyzed by a dietitian, so I know that it works for me and I know what I've got to do to make it work. So where are where you getting random food from varying stores? And some of the towns, the stores were pretty tiny. So there was Ellendale as an example. You could It was the post office. You could go in there and get a hot chocolate or a cup of coffee and they had a couple of things on the shelf, but it wasn't the main resupply town. That was the next town over. So it's the sort of thing that... If you are going to do this, you need to check the towns you're walking through, work out what is available. And in the written write-up, I talk about three different types of towns. There are those that rate a Woolworths, there are those that rate an IGA, and then there are those that have the little corner shop sort of thing, and they vary. And the other thing is that, you know, if you're on trail, you're you're not actually going, you've you went through more towns than you had planned to because you had to get off trail a couple of times. Yeah, yeah. So, so Deloraine was a lovely little town. It was seven kilometres off uh, trail, uh, but probably one of my most favourite towns of the whole trip. Uh, and I think the, my other comment with food boxes as well is people traditionally, when they live in a state, will drive up, drop boxes of food at certain places and pick them up as they go through. But, you know, if you're in Hobart, you drive the trail and drive back, there's probably about seven or 800 kilometres worth of driving you do, whereas you put them in the post with Australia Post, both our re- both of my resupply boxes that we sent forward uh, actually turned up two days after they left Canberra. Uh, I think the entire postage bill for those two boxes was around about $125, uh, but that was certainly much cheaper than driving a car up and back and certainly saved the day's time in doing it. So, you know, Really, the postal system is a very good opportunity to do these things. God, we we rarely hear that, Tim. <laughs> yes. uh, and uh, I've actually, in the written uh, write-up of this walk, I've put a link and this podcast goes to air on Wednesday night. In five to six days' time, I'm going to release a dedicated article that talks in detail about food resupply and what the process is working with Australia Post. It's not as difficult as it would seem. It is a really simple process. And what was interesting was the ability to redirect as well. And, uh, you know, you did that a couple of times, I yeah, think. Yeah, and that, in all honesty, that surprised me. I'm I'm a fan of uh, some, one trail I'd like to do is the Pacific Crest Trail in the States. And they have things called bounce boxes where you post a box ahead and you're allowed to redirect it if you don't need it. So if you get to a town early, decide you don't need it, you can send it on at no extra charge. I did that the first time and I fully expected to have to pay for a redirection cost. And the person at the Australia Post shop said, no, no, that's fine. It hasn't been opened. We'll just send it to where you want it to go. I then got to New Norfolk and this is when I decided to cancel the trip and I redirected that box back home again. Uh, and again, <laughs> the same I, box. <laughs> I, I, I expect this. You know, so this box has gone from Canberra to uh, uh, Ouse to New Norfolk, back to Canberra again for the cost of one postage charge. And I was, as I said, I was expecting to have to pay at least one of those times to go through and do that. So I think, in all honesty, it's um, it, it is a really good system, and Australia Post. Uh, has got their parcel delivery down pat uh, and it, it is just not worth driving to, uh, somewhere unless you have no other option. So unless you're hoping to pick up food in the middle of the bush, that's when you've got to do go through and do a cash or a, a physical resupply as opposed to sending a, a, po- a box through the mail. So we've talked a bit about this, but why wouldn't you do this trail? I think if you're looking for a wilderness experience, this is not it. This is a rural experience of Tasmania and getting to know Tasmania rather than a a wilderness experience. So if you want wildlife, if you want wildflowers, 
this isn't the trip for you. I still enjoyed walking through Tasmania. I still enjoyed seeing it. I particularly like the cows in the northern part of the island. <laughs> uh, they would come up to me, they would moo at me, and they would walk along the fence for anything up to half a kilometre following me because they were really interested or, or else they were expecting to be fed. Uh, whereas I, sh- I skipped over the central plateau and all of a sudden the cows didn't want to know me. They'd back off and be, <laughs> oh, this is really scary. Um, but, yeah, it was quite interesting actually and they, was, they were just really interested in what I was doing. And so I guess that means why you would do it is to experience rural life in Tassie. Yeah, I think to experience rural life in Tassie, to see what Tasmania is like. I must admit, I think... If I was going to look at doing it again, I would seriously consider doing it by bicycle. I think uh, the, a lot of the campsites are sort of 32 kilometres plus apart, uh, which is quite doable uh, on, a, on a push bike, whereas walking can be a bit of a push. So I think you know, this would be a really good option doing it in summertime on a push bike. Uh, and again, picking up resupply boxes or potentially buying food as you're going. Yeah, good. So, Yeah. All up, a trip that I was glad that I did. Uh, as I said, it's it's one of these sort of walks that a lot of people just don't realise is there. Uh, and if you're trying to do a walk, particularly during periods of COVID and you happen to live in Tasmania, you don't have to leave home to do it. Okay, we hope you've enjoyed this and the previous podcasts on the Tasmanian Trail. As I said, if you haven't already done so, go through and see the written write-up of the Tasmanian Trail, and the link will be on the podcast page, uh, and that way you can see all the images uh, and the links to the Tasmanian Trail itself. Okay, we hope you've enjoyed. That's all for me. Bye for now. And bye from me.